Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our discussion now of Longfellow's Psalm of Life. Now we're using this text as introduction to our class and this thing we call annotation, reading and taking notes. Just to remind, we build everything off of the understanding of our learning theory. Now you'll already have been exposed to some of those ideas from our LearnStrong.net site right here on the home page, intro to room 303, there's four guiding lectures and one of those is about annotation. So we'll ask that you've already watched that information. Now ostensibly what we're going to do is practice annotating a really famous poem by the great American poet Longfellow. Believe it or not that's his name. Now you have the poem in front of you or at LearnStrong.net, down the bottom of the home page, you can see a PDF of the poem. You'll see dates there of 1807 to 1882, so you can kind of get a sense of where we'll place him in relationship to any number of other great American writers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Walt Whitman, Whitman's Leaves of Grass, first published in 1855, so that gives you kind of a sense of where we are. Obviously, he's well lived through the American Re or the, the American Civil War, right? So there you have some information about Longfellow. But now we're very interested in asking, can I learn from my reading of this poem by answering three guiding questions? Remember, at level one, what does the text say? We're just simply summarizing. At level two, what does the text mean? Two A themes messages. Two B rhetoric, not what Longfellow says, but how Longfellow says it. And then at level three, we'll ask the simple question, how can I, what, relate to this information in some meaningful way? At 3A, how can I relate to other texts I know, other things I've read, other things I've listened to, other things I've seen, other things I've, are, are we ready to say this out loud, played? Video games for us are texts, as valuable as anything that we would read. And then finally, at 3B, we'll ask, how can I personally relate to this information? We own the information, is what we like to say. In other words, we're getting things we can actually use so that the poem, hopefully, has some message that is some value to us. At the beginning of a school year, we love to start with this poem to ask, can we really understand what we're doing here? What is the whole point of this project anyway? Let's go ahead now. We'll look at the poem. Notice the title, Psalm of Life. Now, if you ever picked up that book called the Bible and you randomly opened it to roughly the center of the book, you would, call, you would see a collection of poems called psalms. So Longfellow is playing around with this word. Put it on your notes there. Psalm means song. And, of course, then that will tell you this is going to be a poem about life to some degree. Yes? So let's now take a look at the poem. Let's get a sense of what's, of, of what's being said here. Notice how he begins. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real. Life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Now let's pause for a moment, and let's just point out very quickly a couple of imp important ideas. Notice right away, at 2B, not what Longfellow says, but how Longfellow says it. Notice at 2B right away a couple of interesting things. Do you notice that this poem is divided into four line stanzas? Do you see that? Down the left hand side you should probably number those stanzas. How many of them are there? Okay, so go ahead and do that really quickly. And then you should as well point out that the number of stanzas that you have times four will give you the total number of lines of this poem. Also, did you notice something interesting? Look at the first stanza. Numbers, slumbers. I'm looking at the last words of lines one and three. Dream, seen. I'm looking at the last words of lines two and four. Earnest, returnest. Second stanza. Goal, soul. Do you see it? Now, what we'll say about this is then we're messing around with an A, B, A, B kind of rhyme scheme. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Uh, something very else interesting in 2B, really quickly. Notice how there's two ways I can read this poem. Watch this. I can read this poem as, tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real. Life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. Thus thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. That's one way I can read it. 
There's another way for me to read it, though. Watch this. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real, life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Na 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 na. Mr. McGee, please stop now. You hearing that rhythm? Right? You hearing that rhythm? For those of you who love your rap, you now are beginning to look at the genesis of a whole lot of rap. In other words, great rap artists understand the genius of poets like this, like Longfellow. Are you ready for this? In Song of Hiawatha, he writes thousands of lines and never breaks this rhythm one time. Now, do you think this is intentional or do you think this is lucky on Longfellow's part? Right, right, right. You got it. In other words, this is poetic genius that we're playing with. And this is the way poems are written in roughly the time of Longfellow. By the way, just for your notes, at 3A, where we're comparing to other texts, write this down. The great American poet Walt Whitman, a contemporary of Longfellow, will say, nobody actually talks like that in real life. Na, 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 na. I'm going to go ahead and break with that idea, and I'm going to go ahead and write in Leaves of Grass normal speech pattern poetry, which later will, of course, be called open form or free verse poetry. So we're going to have Whitman breaking with Longfellow in a very intentional way, but we don't want to take away from what Longfellow is pulling off here at 2B. All right, having said what we've said about rhetoric, we're now, though, ready to jump right into the poem. What exactly does this poem say? Notice right away, Longfellow reminds us what it means to be an American. Do you remember this? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are what? Life, liberty, the pursuit of Scooby Snacks. You'll remember that, right? Who said that? Well, that was Tommy and his pals. Who? What, wait, wait, wait. What, what do we call that document? The Declaration of Independence. Of course, we've given full lectures on that document elsewhere at LearnStrong.net. But it is significant to point out that if you need a single line or mantra to describe what it means to be an American, it's don't tell me what to do, right? Don't tell me what to do. In other words, I, I figure it out on my own, I, don't tell me what to do. Notice the opening line of this poem, tell me not. In other words, don't tell me. In mournful numbers, that is to say in statistics, life is but an empty dream. Put it in your own words, level one. What's he say right away? Well, don't tell me that life has no meaning. I don't want to hear about that. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Whoa, 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 what did we just read? The soul is dead that slumbers. What is a soul? Well, I mean, first of all, let's point out, Longfellow is postulating that there are two yous, at least two. There's this thing called your body, and then there's this thing, and he will call your soul. Now, what in heaven's name are we talking about there? Can you please explain that one to me? A uh, soul? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's something other than this body. It's something other than this. Um, some people will call it soul. Some people will call it mind. Some people will call it consciousness. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Notice, you have to have a mind to argue you don't have a mind. So, where is my soul? Well, it's in, it's in my brain. Oh, good, so if I cut off the top of your head, I'm going to see your soul in your brain. If I cut off the top of your skull, I'll see your soul in your brain? What, with some kind of might? No, no, oh, so it doesn't exist. Well, no, it, it, you can't see it. What, what do you mean you can't see it? Then it obviously doesn't exist. Well, no, but... But, but I know it has to exist because I'm thinking thoughts right now, and that's called my mind. Your mind. Where is your mind? Is that in your brain? So I'm going to cut off the top of your head, and I'm going to find your mind in your brain. Well, 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 no. Oh, so you don't have a mind. Well, I thought I did before you started this foolishness. Where is your mind? One of my students once said, it's in my big toe, Mr. McGee. I suppose it's as good an answer as any. Notice Longfellow postulates there's two of you. There is a body. But there's also a soul, a mind, a consciousness. Or, of course, we can just, isn't this fun the way we invent myths? Or we can just call it energy, which is exactly what you are. Energy. You learned it in third grade. That which can be neither what? Created or destroyed. Oh, so it doesn't exist. Oh, no, it definitely exists. Dude, you just said it can't be created or destroyed. It clearly can't exist. No, it definitely exists. It's, what, it's everything. I mean, that's what, that's what we are. We're walking energy. I mean, we're energy. That's what we are. Energy? Like, give me five pounds of that really quick in my hand. No, 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 you don't understand. That's not the way it works. 
This is the game Longfellow is playing. Hey, can we point out we're three lines, four lines into this poem? He's already making us think. Thank you, Longfellow. We appreciate that, right? Let's keep going. He says, for the soul is dead that slumbers. In other words, you can be asleep. Now, the contemporary of Longfellow was Thoreau. And he said it this way. I'm making a 3A observation. Thoreau. 3A observation. He says in Walden, we must learn to reawake and to keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn that does not forsake us in our soundest sleep. I know of no more encouraging fact than the ability of a man to reawaken through a conscious endeavor. Wow. Now that is an interesting idea. Conscious endeavor. This is the same concept here. In other words, if you go to sleep physically, that's one thing. But what about going to sleep mentally? See, some of us have had to admit, I think as a student, I sometimes have done that. Are you, are you familiar with this concept? Where you start at 8 in the morning and by 3 in the afternoon, you can't name three things you actually did that day that were actually useful. Other than like, you know, kind of cows getting up and moving from one holding pen to the next as the bell rings. That is to say, we're slumbering. He says, your soul is dead. And then he says something that all of us have an insight that is probably true. Things are not what they seem. Do you have a sense of this sometimes? You know what? Things aren't every. Things aren't always like they appear to be. There is something else going on. I just don't have full clue about it. You know what I'm saying? So I've got to learn a few more things. By the way, notice that this poem has a little subtitle, What the Heart of the Young Man Said to the Poet or to the Psalmist. The idea here is that what is it that really should matter to you as a young person? Look at what he says in the second stanza. Life is real. Life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What is he saying here? Simple. Think about it. The thing you caught that you have that's your life, it's real. And it's earnest. Put it in your notes. It's important. Of course, they were teaching this to us when we were very, very young, weren't they? Because they took us to the park and we loved to swim. And of course, at some point, some adult in your life said to you, what? Hey, honey, time to go to the van. And what is it that you said? I don't want to go to the van. I want to keep swimming. And what did the adult say? No, no honey, you can't stay at the park forever. You got to go to the van. Everybody's got to go to the van. They were teaching it to you at a very young age because you ain't met no 200-year-old people. Think about that. Have you met a 200-year-old person? No, I have not. Why not? D-E-A-T-H. Everybody's got to go to the van. I don't want to go to the van. No, no. Everybody's got to go to the van. Talked to a student once. He said to me, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this whole thing called living. I think I'm ready to end it, Mr. McGee. I know how to end it. I think I'm ready to go. What do you say to that? I said, well, it's simple. No, no, no. They were teaching this to you when you were very young. You don't have to end your life now. Your life will end. You ain't met no 200-year-old people. And because you ain't met no 200-year-old people, what does that tell you? You want to swing at the park for a very short period of time. And then you got to go bye-bye to the van. Oh, no, the van is waiting. You don't have to put no slug in your brain for the van is waiting. It's there. It's waiting. And since you are at the park and you get to swing, why not swing well? That's our point. Life is real. Life is earnest. And the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest. Where do you hear that line? Funerals. Because why? You ain't met no 200 year old people. But dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of the soul. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What would you just read? Well, this is going to be a line that will be echoed at 3A. You can write it down. Echoed in Whitman's Leaves of Grass, Song of Myself, Passage 6. When we study that together, we'll hear the same concept. Death is a fascinating thing because what dies and what goes away, if you have a mind or a soul, if you're aware right now that you can have thoughts, question, what happens when your body dies? Longfellow argues that thing called your soul or your consciousness, it doesn't die with your body. And because that's the case, you want to take good care of it while you're alive. Because the body dies, but not the soul. 
Or to put it another way for your notes, life is about a whole lot more than simply your body. Life is about so much more because it's important how you swing at the park. Look at the third stanza. Talk about swinging at the park. How about this for a question? What's life really for? You know what I mean? I, I'd write that question down. What is life really for? Look at what he says. He begins with the negative. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us further than today. Notice he says life isn't just about enjoyment. No, no, no. It's not about always being sad either. So life isn't just about being high and happy all the time. Life is also not just about being sad all the time. Well, then what's it for? But to act. That each tomorrow find us further than today. Whoa. I would write this down. This is an amazing thing for us to start our time together with as a concept. What about this? What if you were to say to yourself in the morning when you wake up? Today. Before I go to bed tonight. I'm going to try and learn one new thing that I didn't know from the day before. What would that be like? What would that be like? To be able to say, I don't know what's going to happen today. <clears throat> I'm going to have a whole lot of challenges. And when bad stuff happens, I'm not going to ask, why did this happen to me? I'm going to learn to ask, why did this happen for me? I'm going to try to learn from the pain of my life, from the suffering of my life. But I know one thing, before the end of my day, when I go to bed tonight, I'm going to be able to say at least there's one thing I learned that I did not know before. But to act that each tomorrow find us further than today. In other words, progression. Put it in your notes that way. Right? Lifelong learning. Your schooling is not your education. No, 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 no. Your schooling is a small, small fragment of your education. Your education is your life. And to that degree, learn something new every day. So that by the time you get ready to leave the park and go to the van, because you ain't met no 200-year-old people, you'll be able to say that you swam well and that you learned something while you were doing it. Look at the next one. Art is long. Art outlasts the artist. And time is fleeting. You ain't met no 200-year-old people. And our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating. Funeral marches to the grave. Now, some of, my students, some of my students, they love this line more than any other because of the word picture. In Longfellow's day, you died not in a hospital <clears throat> often. You died at home in the bed that you slept in all your life. And when you got ready to die, all your pals came and sat around you. And then when you finally passed away, they would put you in a cart and they would take you outside of town to the graveyard. Everybody would line up behind to walk in reverence and respect in front of all the people but behind the cart where you were you know, laying dead. There was a little boy with a drum and he would hit the drum slowly. Boom. 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 And that's the speed at which everyone walked to get to the cemetery to bury you. And it hit Longfellow. That boom. Boom. Drum. Boom. All you have to do right now is hold your finger against your throat. Go ahead and do it and just feel. Feel it. Boom. 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 There's your pulse. That's beating, but not for long. Art is long and time is fleeting and our hearts, though stout and brave, hey, hey, hey. You haven't been alive very long. you got this really, really strong heart. I wonder how it'll be beating at the age of 80. Of course, you see, think about it. You're almost to 20, which puts you halfway to 40. Woo, think about that. I wonder what kind of 40-year-old you're going to be. I mean, think about that. What kind of 40-year-old are you going to be? Are you going to be a 40-year-old that a 17-year-old will look at and go, Oh, jeez, I hope when I'm 40 I don't end up looking and, and acting like that. Or are you going to be a 40-year-old that 17-year-olds will look at it and say, that's what I want to be like? It's an interesting question. Look at the next one. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivvywhack of life, that's how we say that word, by the way, bivvywhack of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. Now, this is an amazing little word picture. Bivvywhack, of course, just simply means the encampment in a battle. What's Longfellow say? Three things. Run. Write it down. Life is a struggle. Life is a war. Life is a fight. And anybody that tells you something other than that, 
They ain't telling you the truth. Life is a struggle. It's going to be way harder than it's going to be easier for most of your life. You're going to have more challenges than you're going to have Scooby Snacks. That's why we say often Scooby Snacks are an illusion, right? Number two, in the world's broad field of battle, in the bivy whack of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. I remember when I first came to Wyoming for the very first time to visit, they took me for a drive. I was very tired. I went to sleep, and all of a sudden, in the back seat of the car, I felt the car had stopped. I opened my eyes to look out a window right into the face of a cow. No, I'm serious. There were cows all around the car because out in Wyoming, what do they do down the old highways? They drive their cows. We literally were stopped in the middle of the of the, of the road and there are cows all around. You know, I'm from the city. I'm looking into the snout of this huge cow right next to the window. And then for the first time, I got to see a cow up close with the snot and the poop all over its nose. Why? Because he walks shoving his nose up into the butt of the cow in front of him as they all walk in line and the cow in front poops and he's getting it all and then the thought occurred to me this is Longfellow's line in this world's broad field of battle in the bivouac of life be not like dumb driven cattle be a hero in the strife be a hero you know, it's a funny thing how moms love to ask their kids, well, if everyone jumped off the bridge, would you jump off the bridge too? And the answer for most high school students is what? Yeah, 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 I would. Why? Because I can't have people laughing at me. I can't. I, I just can't live with it. I can't. Longfellow says, at what point your life become your life? Answer, when you decide to be a hero in the strife, to stand up and to live a life that's worth